Here we go again. Part two of the design project. So we've completed the uh, elastic um, allowable stress portion of the design that has set the force and the profile. Now we're moving on to <clears throat> the strength calculations. We will look at flexural strength, we'll look at shear strength. Um, start with flexural strength. So the first thing to do, if we want to know what the demand is going to be, is to calculate the secondary moments. So let's go back. Remember we had already calculated the equivalent load moment diagram and I just copied that in here. What I want you to focus on right now is the go back to the center line. You checked your values at the face of the column with PT data and decided we were all good. Now, to calculate the secondary moments, I want you, it really is going to make sense. and It'll become clear um, why we want to stay with the center line. So these, whoops. Are the center line moments. Remember that we're calculating the equivalent load moment diagram subtracting the primary pre-stress moment diagram from that. So you'll notice you know, we anchor at the center of gravity at both ends of the beams. So whatever moment we are calculating due to the equivalent loads is the secondary moment. So minus F times E with E being zero, we're going at the two ends to have exactly this. Now, hopefully that makes sense to you. Remember what the secondary moments are. They are the restraint caused by supports. You pre-stress the beam, the beam wants to deflect into a shape, it wants to bend, it wants to rotate at its ends. The columns now are actually fixing somewhat fixing I and mean, they have flexibility some flexibility but they're providing restraint to the beam doing what it wants to do due to the pre-stressing so it not only wants to lift at the supports like it did before when when we were doing homework four and five it actually is being restrained from rotation too so that's why we have a moment now at the two ends of the beams um, so the beam's trying to rotate, trying to twist, wants a rotation at this joint, and the column is not letting it do that. So the column is part of the restraint, the support restraint. All secondary effects are due to support restraint. And before we were only looking at vertical restraint. Now we're looking at rotational and vertical restraint. Okay. So let's look at the, um, I'm gonna pick out one location and we're gonna calculate the secondary, the demand moment at that location. And then most likely I'm gonna have you do the demand lo uh, moments at all locations. So that remains to be seen. See how nice I'm feeling when I put together that um, problem, but um, your project. But I, I think I'm going to do that. It's not a big deal and it's nice to see what the demand moments at all locations are. And then I'll have you focus on doing the design at, at the worst case, at the controlling location. So at the interior support B. So this is what we're talking about. And remember, because we have columns, we have a moment, an equivalent load moment to the left side in span one, and we have an equivalent load moment to the right side of the joint in span two, and they're not the same. The difference being this portion is exactly what the columns are taking it. So having columns changes this a little bit from what we've been doing. There is a primary pre-stress moment. It's the force times this eccentricity right there. That eccentricity is the difference between 11.4 inches and this four inches. So 7.4 inches. We can calculate that easily 
force times eccentricity. So the, the primary pre-stress moment at this location is 164.2 foot kips. F times E divided by 12. The final equivalent load moment was 380 on the left side. And just the way the page is worked out here, it's 255 on the right side. So the secondary moment is just the difference. So the 380 minus the 164.2 is going to be the secondary moment in span one to the left side of the interior joint. So that 215.8 is going to turn out to be right there. To the right side, the equivalent load moment was 255.1. We're going to subtract that same primary pre-stress moment. This is why we're doing it at the center line. It is difficult to do this, and I don't want you doing it at the face of the column because you don't know exactly what the CGS is. So E is, you'd have to go into PT data and you'd have to see what, um, what the value of the CGS was here. I'm sorry, here, yeah, it's all disappear. Here and here. So it's, it's not easy to do those calculations directly at the face of column. It's easiest if you do everything at the center lines and then figure out what they need to be at the face of the column. So that's why we're doing this. These establish those which are the center line values. Let's look at support A, like we already discussed, the primary pre-stress moment is zero at the support. So the secondary moment's going to be exactly equal to the, um, the equivalent load moment. Same thing on this side. So we calculated an equivalent load moment at the center line of 125 foot kips at the right support. That's what the secondary moment's gonna be. So Really the work was right here, and it wasn't a lot of work. So what I, I want you to do, and you know, mistakes will be made if you don't do this, figure out what the secondary moment is here, just like I did here. Figure out what it is here and here, and just draw those straight lines. Just, just draw those. And from that diagram, figure out, based upon the gradient of these moment lines, figure out what you get at the face of the column. Because, I mean, for instance, the face column moment's actually larger than it is at the center line. It's not reducing like you were used to before. Actually, um, the same thing here. This is actually increasing as you go to the face of the column. From this side, it's decreasing. But to me, the easiest way to do it is just set up the center line, draw that diagram. It will become obvious if you're increasing or decreasing your moment value to get to the face. And once you get to the face, check those values. PT data, again, like before, is only going to give you the values at the face of the column. But look how close I got. 217.4 here, 217.3 there. Close enough for government work. The second span, the 91.68. That's the same number. And we're looking for a 124.2. We got close. So that's it. And as you're doing your calculations, again, you don't need my help unless you just can't match the PT data output. But I'm giving you, I will give you the PT data output. In the next video, I'm actually going to walk you through how I did this in PT data and, and where everything is. Um, and if you're using the program, playing along at home, or you've purchased it, um, I'll, I'll show you how to use it. We're doing the hand stuff 
right now. What's, the next part is not really necessary, but I, I appreciate each year when I see the students actually do this anyway. This, this I said not required for, the design of the beam is actually not required for your project either, but um, you like to know that statics works. So on the beam, the beam itself, remember the, the equivalent loads are creating tension on the bottom of the beam and the secondary moments are doing the same thing. So they're, you're creating tension on the bottom side of the beam. So hopefully you know which way to put these moment areas, moment air rows. <clears throat> okay, so all the secondary stuff is creating tension on the bottom of the beam. We know that in this diagram. And again, I, the whole course, we're drawing everything to the tension side. So interestingly enough, the secondary moment diagram entirely creates tension on the bottom of the beam, both spans everywhere. Interesting. So I have another point that I'm trying to make by doing this. So I'm going to show you the statics of this. So I put the, the moments on in the, in the direction I know they're going, creating tension on the bottom. I calculate the left shear and the right shear based upon, you know, th this 313 is greater than 215.8. So the net is going clockwise. So this must be coming down. This must be going up. And I can calculate those shears. Same thing on span two. This side's bigger, so the net moment between these two is going that way. This must be going up, this must be going down to keep that from rotating down the street. And I can calculate the shears there. So I have the shears, this is all acting on the beam. If I wanna know what's happening on the support, because I'm gonna design the support, I just reverse everything. So whatever is happening on the beam is happening in the opposite direction on the support. So these two add up and reverse, and that's what I get for the moment at the interior support. So the point is, or one of the points, yeah, statics is, is satisfied, and on the next sheet, I show you that some of the forces equal zero, they must be. Pre-stressing didn't create load, doesn't, create gravity effects. It's, it, this has to be zero. Some of the moments must be zero. So if you wanna check that, make sure that you're understanding all this, check your own numbers. Um, you should get zero for the sum of the forces and the sum of the moments. Um, the other reason I thought this was important to go through is that while these secondary moments they're pretty substantial. You, you really couldn't ignore those, and that's, that's the major point. Um, secondary moments, the code requires you to include those in the design because they are not negligible. They're far from negligible. These are significant numbers. However, the shears are relatively small. If you look at these compared to the factored shear, the 1.2 dead and 1.6 live shears, you're going to see that, that these are effectively insignificant. Now, I wanna be really careful. I said that one year and then gave an exam and asked students to calculate the secondary shears. And I got a few of them writing back, secondary shears are insignificant. I'm just not gonna do it. And that didn't bode well for them. You know, if on an exam I ask you what the secondary shears are, I want you to calculate them. Whether or not they're considered significant or not, or whether or not in practice we'll end up using them is another story. But if I ask for it, I want it. So I, I don't entirely agree just because I'm a statics nut. Um, I think statics should always be followed. The code kind of says follow statics for the moments, but ignore statics for the shear design. I see the practicality in that, but then there's an inconsistency. So we'll just leave it at that. Okay, so we found the secondary moments. 
on this entire beam. Now let's find the full demand moment. And I'm going to pick one location. I'm going to pick the interior support B location. And I'm going to pick the left side of the joint because it's fairly obvious in this case that's going to be the largest one. So recall that we calculated a face of column moment, dead load moment of, and I'm keeping the signs, you know, negative moment, frowning face is helpful here. 505.1 foot kips. The live load at the same location was negative 221.1. We have just calculated the secondary moment to be 217.4. And remember the demand moment, we had to make up that term. It doesn't exist in the code is MU plus M2. MU being defined by the code, load factors multiplied by dead and live load. And then it says in words that we must include the effects of pre-stressing, support restraint, however they're saying it these days, with a load factor of 1. So that means 1.0 M2. So remember that we got this from here. So I'm right now just looking at this, this joint on this side. So the demand moment is 1.2 times that dead load, 1.6 times that live load, 1.0 times the secondary moment. And this is what we need to design for. So the secondary moment helps us. Again, just like it did before, it's actually gonna help us actually at all the supports. Um, it will add to the positive moments just like it did in the in the homework number five that we did, but that's okay. We can handle it in the positive moments. We don't mind that. So I've calculated by hand 742.5. PT data says it's 742.7. That's pretty darn close for doing hand calcs and matching a computer to 64 digits. So we've established the demand, and like I said, depending on the mood I'm in, I, I'm probably going to ask you to calculate the demand at all four faces of the columns and at the two positive moments. And then I will, um, the plan right now in my mind is to have you design the controlling positive moment and the controlling negative moment, which will be a, one of the two faces of the interior joint. So. That's my example right here. I'm going to look at the left side of the interior joint. You're going to design most likely whatever side is controlling in your project that I've given you. Remember the span to depth ratio and I've got problems with the way this is written because <laughs> there's, this was intended for beams and the other uh, equation was intended for slabs. But every once in a while with the way the spans work, you can end up reversing those, or at least with slabs, be stuck with the beam equation. But we'll discuss that in the slabs class if you move on that far. I have so many frustrations. It's a big part of my lectures. So the span to depth ratio tells us we're less than 35. That's intended to be a beam equation. It worked out this time. And this is that equation, unbonded post-tensioning FPS equation. Not the FSE every day, effective stress of 174 that we think we have. This is at failure, remember. So at failure, we expect an increase in the stress in the strand, in the tendon. And this is how we get there. So we get to start off, the, the one calculation we really have to do is rho P. So APS B DP. And what I'm telling you here is I'm allowing you just to go into the PT data output that I give you to figure out at the face of the column what the CGS of the tendon is. You don't have to calculate that yourself. PT data will have done all those calculations. It's going to tell you where the center of gravity of the steel is. From the top, all of these values are always in our program dimensioned from the top of the beam 
or a Y reference point, which should be set at the top of the beam. Okay, so DP is the depth of the beam minus that CGS value, so it's 30.4 inches. Rho P being the 10 strands times 0.153 square inches divided by 15 inch beam web and D, DP. Come up with rho p of 0, 0, 00336. Remember, we've done this calculation now before. This isn't new to you. I've re rewritten it out. But we consider, and our software program considers the effective stress, the everyday stress, to be 70% of FPU minus a long-term loss of 15 KSI. That's what we've put in there. So we're always working with 174, always. Even in slabs, when we get there, we'll be that's what we'll be working with. So at failure, we can assume we can use a stress in the tendons, in the pre-stressing steel of 174 plus 10,000 just for fun, F prime C divided by 100 rho P, and we get 198.9 KSI at failure. We're limited to, um, you know, and I always put this in there because the code does. FP yield um, was calculated previously to be 243. Every time you do this calculation, 234 will be less than 243. Every single time I've ever done that, 234 is less than 243. So I don't even worry about that anymore. The controlling will always be there used to be different types of strands. So we had stress relieved, low relaxation, there was a variety of things. So, so it wasn't always the case that, that this was going to be less than this, but since we always have 270 KSI now, um, steel, pretty much um, locks in the fact that this is the controlling value. So for us, we are going to use the calculated value of 198.9 KSI for ultimate strength. And I verify that by going to PT data, span one, looking at the face of the column and saying that, hey, looks like I did it right. And again, I want you to keep doing that. Don't, don't run through all your calculations and then decide at the end to go back and see how you did. As you calculate, <laughs> Check it. It'll save you a lot of time. Okay, so now we have to come up with an amount of rebar. We're designing. We are truly designing now. And I gave you the pre-stressing because I didn't want to grade 70 different projects. So I gave you the, the force and the profile of the post-tensioning. But I'm actually going to have you calculate what rebar, what bonded um, rebar is required. Well, remember that we had a minimum bonded reinforcement requirement of 004 area of the concrete in tension. So the side of the neutral axis that's in tension wherever you're looking, that area of concrete, and we're at a support. So remember, we're the inside, um, we're the interior joint. So the top of the beam is in tension. We have negative bending. So this is what ACT is for negative bending. In the spans, ACT will be based on this area, but that's not what we're doing right now. So I calculate that area of concrete. So my point in doing all this is I've got to come up with some amount of rebar required to meet the demand moment. I don't know what that is. But I can start with a good guess, and the good guess would be, let's start with the minimum required area of bonded reinforcement. It doesn't make any sense to be less than what you have to provide. So we have to provide at least the minimum bonded reinforcement. So let's start with that. Let's calculate what that is, figure out how many bars that's going to be, then look and, and add that to our FPS, APS as our tension total tension and see what that gets us. How close does that get us to the demand moment? Does that exceed the demand moment? 
but this is a great starting point. So I calculate 571 square inches of uh, ACT, multiply that by 004 and come up with an absolute minimum, by the way, at all of the negative moment locations. So the left joint, the right joint, the interior joint will all have a minimum amount of, of bonded reinforcement of 2.28 square inches. I will give you in the project, I'll tell you, we're, we're using number eight, so we're using number sevens or sixes or nines or tens, whatever I tell you that I want you to use, you do have to do that. So when I give you a, a bar size, you're trying to figure out just how many of those bars we need. So in this case, I've told myself I'm only using number eight bars. Three number eight bars gives me more than the absolute minimum I'm required to provide. So that's a great starting point. Let's do, let's see what moment capacity we have at the interior joint when we use three number eights in addition to the pre-stressing that we have. So this will be our negative moment force diagram at that interior joint, theoretically on the left side. So three number eights times 60 KSI gives me 142.2 kips. 10 post-tensioning strands at 0.153 square inches at the FPS value that we calculated of 198.9 gives me 304.3 kips. We never use compression steel. We, we'll find out if we need it later, but we don't use compression steel um, in the initial moment capacity calculations. I don't want you to do that. Remember, I've told you that when we did the homework number five. So, makes life easier. Concrete force is just the sum of these two tension forces. Statics must apply in this section. So, I know that the force in the concrete is the sum of those two, 446.5 kips. I set up my Whitney stress block depth, just like we did before. We've done this. I told you this whole project is really redoing the homework assignments you've already done. I get a Whitney stress block depth of seven inches. Remember that's coming from this side. That's where compression is. The neutral axis depth is a proportion of the Whitney stress block depth by the beta one factor. So neutral axis C value is actually 8.75. Be careful and remember, depending on what I've given you, if this is 4,000 PSI concrete, then that beta one is 0.85. If I give you 5,000 PSI concrete, beta one is 0.8. So be careful. I'm looking at actually what and where the rebar is. The beam is 36 inches deep. There's a 1.5 inch cover to the stirrups. The stirrups are number three bars and I'm using number eight bars. So half of a number eight bar is actually one half inch. Number eight bar is eight eighths inch in diameter. So it's one inch in diameter, one half inch to the centroid of it. So PT data is using this and you're using this. 33.6 is the distance from the compression face to the centroid of the tension mild rebar. Now, <laughs> I have a confession here. Somewhere in there, I have the actual value of the depth to the post-tensioning and that is should be coming up in this value. These are not at the same location. What I want you to do in your calculations is calculate where 
the pre-stressing actually is. And you can find that the same way we did before. Just go to the PT data um, output that I gave you. It tells you exactly where the tendon is at the face of the column. So accurately, please calculate DP. And you don't have to do it yourself. You don't have to calculate a parabolic profile. PT data will tell you at the face of the column where the CGS is. Just use that. Just use that. So I think we're all pretty good at this. You just did homework number five. The class always does well in that. And I come up with an overall moment capacity, usable moment capacity, 0.9 fee factor. We're always going to assume the beam's tension controlled, so that's always 0.9. Looks like three number eights works. The last thing I have to do is verify that my tension controlled fee factor of 0.9 is correct. I set the value at 003 at the compression face. Remember, I had calculated what the neutral axis depth is. And I set up similar triangles and I calculate that at the, by the way, just so we're always clear, this is always at the extreme reinforcement. And the extreme reinforcement is always going to be the rebar, always going to be the bonded rebar. The PT may go up and meet it, but most likely it's on its way down. By the face of the column, it's come down. Um, and even the CGS at center line is going to be a little bit lower than the rebar. So we're talking about the rebar whenever we're talking about doing a, a tension controlled strain diagram. So in this case, we are well past the 005 limit. So the beam is tension controlled, the fee factor of 0.9 applies, and we don't need to calculate any compression reinforcement. That doesn't mean on your project you might not have to. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. Depends on the mood I was in when I set up the project. Okay, so that was the flexural design at one location. I think that's all I'm going to ask you to do is calculate that one singular location. And uh, I assume if you can do one, you could also do the other faces of the column. Um, I am also not going to do an example to go through the same exact stuff and show you how to do the positive moment calculation. You just did that in homework number five. So you don't really need my help. We just saw how things work, um, but I will likely on your project ask you to calculate wherever the, the highest demand moment is in the span, verify that that works doing the same methodology, figure out what the minimum area of bonded steel is in the positive regions, use that as your basis for calculating the strength that you have and see if you need to add any steel. Good enough. Okay, well, we're going to finish up with shear design. And that you've just done <laughs> in kind of a grueling way in homework number six. So again, I kind of apologize. I, I've intended and hopefully I did for you tick my foot off the gas on the homework six design or assignment also. So that wasn't as grueling as it's been in the past. Um, I am really just going to briefly go over this right here because you just finished, you should have just finished doing that. Um, I am looking at that same span one left side of the interior support. <clears throat> That's where all the good activity is happening. Let's check and design the shear at that location. And if you can do one location, you can do all the others. I really don't want you to have to do that using the VCN, VCI, and VCW. I will tell you that in the past projects, I've only made the students do the VCN calculation, but I made them design at all four faces of the columns. Changing that now, um, I'm just going to pick one location, but I want you to do the VCN, the VCI, and the VCW at that location. Um, I think that's probably a push, but more realistic and more realistic of uh, 
of actually matching computer programs, you're going to match the, the PT data computer output like you've been doing. So we'll start with VCN, probably uncomfortably familiar with that equation right now. And we're getting everything, the VU demand doesn't include secondary effects. We're getting it out to the H over 2 from the column phase. So that's that's really almost the, the harder part of this is getting the demand not at the face of the column, but H over 2 from the face of the column. So just keep uh, moving down the shear diagram to get out to that point. You also need to calculate the factored moment at H over 2 from the face of the column. So you should have it at the face of the column now. Just subtract the area under the shear diagram for another H over 2 and figure out what you've got. So that's what I'm doing here. I've, I've got the factored moment at the face of the column. Now I'm figuring out how to extend it farther and get to it at h over 2 from the face of the column. And once again, the way that the code is written in these, this equation is vu and mu. By definition, there's no secondary effects in either one of those. So that's what the code says. Again, the PT data does a good job. The, the first point you're always going to get is the face of column in the PT data output. The second point you're always going to get for moments and shears and CGS and all the other stuff is the H over 2 from face of column. So PT data knows you need those values at both those locations. So it does it for you at those locations. Very helpful. D again, be careful. D is defined, doesn't have to be less than 0.8 H. DP is what DP is in this equation. Remember the confusion from that. It remains. Go through the calculations. Check what VCN is. Um, make sure that for whatever reason this term is less than 1. And we say it's OK. You can check your VCN value against PT data at that exact location. So again, you'll know if you've done it right. You don't need my help. If you can't get it right, then come to me. But this value will come right out of the input, or the, um, sorry, the computer output that I provide to you to do this. Um, I didn't check it here, but you will. So remember our friend VCI, and this is the truly miserable equation. I know that you know how to do this. You've just done it. There's one thing that's different when we go to this project compared to what you did in homework number six. Um, and we will get there. So again, I'm calculating everything has to be done at that H over 2 value. So that's not a lot of fun, but you've got to get all of these values, the dead load shear, out at h over 2. Everything here is being calculated at the h over 2 from the face of the column. That's what the dp here is including. It does not need to be um, it does not need to be taken less than 0.8 h. So you've done this. You're familiar with the effective crack moment equation. The section modulus that we're using in that equation is where cracking is likely to occur due to the applied moment. So we're looking at the section modulus to the top in this case. FPE is the stress at that location where we're looking for a crack due to the pre-stressing. So the pre-stressing is actually causing compression at that location where we're expecting applied loads to cause tension. Mm. <laughs> Just like you did before. So from our equivalent load, 
shear and moment diagrams, we will end up getting these values. I mean, the, the pain in it is reducing it out to the face, but you've got PT data to help you. These, these should all be verifiable in the PT data output. It's just the second printed point. Now this is where I want you to be careful. FPE is defined as you know, the, the stress where tension is caused by applied loads um, at the extreme fiber. It's due to a P over A component and an M over S component. In your homework and in my previous shear example, I used this as F times E. You can't do that here. The beam is not statically determinant. It's statically indeterminate. So the equivalent load moment, the moment caused by pre-stressing, is no longer the primary pre-stress moment. So you've got to know that, and you UCLA students will get tested on that in your final. So I will give you the way to do it both ways. One way is right and one way is wrong. And if I tell you that the beam is um, statically indeterminate, you cannot use the primary pre-stress moment diagram the primary pre-stress moment. So this is just this. That's why we went to the, the trouble of figuring out what the pre-stress moment is at H over 2. So that goes in here and we calculate the stress due to pre-stressing up at the uh, top of the beam. Other than that, everything's just what you did in homework number six. I don't think you need me to walk you through it, the dead load stress. So we calculate the effective cracking moment here just the way we did before of 454.8 foot kips. Um, yeah, I'm reading what I wrote to myself here. In this particular case, I don't have the confusion that we actually have. In, in reality, we don't have columns above during, uh, during stressing. The column hasn't been built yet. The, the structure is being built so fast that it's poured, stressed, you know, it's poured on, say, a Thursday, stressed on a Monday, stripped on Tuesday, so it's holding itself up under dead load and under pre-stressing loads without the benefit of the top column. So you really theoretically would need a new moment distribution that doesn't include distribution factors with a top column there. Not in this project. I'm telling you that the columns are always present. So because of that, the dead load shear and the dead load moment will be the same as the live load shear and the live load moment. Um, ratio, which is really what the code is saying. So any of those will actually work, and in this case I'm actually going to use the dead load and um, dead load shear and dead load moment for that ratio, because I have it handy. You can, you should be able to use whichever one you have handy. It will likely be the same one. Okay, so I can calculate now VCI. VCW, the one equation that makes sense to me, fairly simple. We're just looking at 30% of the direct pre-compression. The direct pre-compression is F over A of 283 PSI. VCW, Same equation you just did in homework number six. D need not be taken less than 0.8 H. So we come up with a VCW. So here's the summary. We have lower bounds to check. Our lower bounds are lower than all of our values. So remember, we can use VCN, and that's what PT data is going to do. It's going to find the, the best answer or the smallest of VCI and VCW. And in this case, our best answer, our most efficient, our least amount of stirrups, is going to be using the VCI equation. 
So I'm going to ask you to do these calcs at one location. Tell me what the stirrups are. You're going to go through this same process. Fee for shear is 0.75, so usable shear component contribution, 88.5 kips. I had a demand at H over 2 of 92.2 kips, and I come up with a VS required. When I go through the calculations, I actually have 77.1 inches for strength. But the maximum spacing I am allowed to have is 75% of H or 24. In this particular case, with a 36 inch deep beam, 24 inches is the maximum spacing I can use. So the answer here at this particular joint, um, and it's not that unusual, it's not that unusual in post tension concrete that the shear demands just aren't that high. These are flexural members that are long spanning post-tension concrete beams. They're not going to develop a tremendous amount of shear, typically. It doesn't mean always, but typically. So it's not that unusual that you end up just with minimum steel, even at your highest joint. So, um, I stated previously that there are AV min equations and in other textbooks you'll see people doing all those numbers. I've done enough for you to know that they will never ever control your design. So that's it. That's that's really the project. Um, I got criticized when I first released the um, first edition of the book that I didn't spend time on deflections. And I didn't because deflections have never, ever once controlled the design of a beam, a one-way slab, or a two-way slab. Post-tensioning eliminates that problem. So we don't have that issue <laughs> anymore. And that's why I didn't spend any time checking it. But to satisfy the critics, um, I will put in what the deflection values. This comes from PT data. We're not going to do this stuff by hand. but. You know, you're limited to something like L over 180 dead, L over 240 or 360, depending on your situation. The L over values that we're going to get are L over 6,561 or L over 24,589. Our deflections are so small that, you know, we, we've balanced them out. We've balanced out most of the dead load, which is the greatest contributor. Live load deflection is never that much. And so, you know, we have a relatively flat system in post tension concrete, always. And, and short term and long term deflections are really never a problem. And if they are, you have a bigger problem, most likely. Something else is really not right about your system. Your system's way too thin. You have way too much load for, for your spans or something like that. But as long as you're within the normal bounds of pre-stress design, deflections are not an issue. This is the PT data output. You can turn your head sideways and look at that. In the next video, I'm gonna walk you through how I just put this in. It's gonna be a relatively quick video because the computer does these things much faster than we do them by hand. I do wanna point out a couple of things. Now, we did a hand analysis and I did simplify a few things. We did not what's called skip or pattern the live load. The code actually requires for one-way systems that we, we do skip live load for, for beams and one-way slabs, which means that I'm really supposed to load up the left span with live load and put no live load in the right span and get the worst positive moment in span one. Then I reverse that and I put all the live load in span two and none of it, no live load in span one and get the worst positive moment in span two. And then to get the worst negative moments, I put all the loads on both spans. So that is what PT data is gonna do. That's what the software you're using is, is likely gonna do. That to me was just an extra complication that wasn't necessary to do this project and to have you demonstrate 
to me and to you that you know what you're doing. So we didn't do that. But I want you to point out, or I want to point out to you that to satisfy the code, we really did need to do that. And then our software, I believe, is the only software that correctly can account for the fact that you know, this, this is one of our jobs. This is, you can even see the pore strip still open. Um, this beam has been stressed the other end. It has been stripped. All, all the formwork has been removed and reshores have not been placed yet. So this, this concrete system under its own weight, under the pre-stressing, is holding itself up. So when we actually wanted to calculate the dead load moment in these spans, we really should have done it with a moment distribution and distribution factors that didn't include a top column. There's nothing there yet. That's just the rebar poking up, waiting for a column to come. The next level, you know, it may be a month away before it's going to get poured, and that stiffness will be there. So it will be there for the live load. Once the cars come and everybody's using the parking structure, you will have the stiffness of the column above and the stiffness of the column below. But for pre-stressing loads and for dead loads, you really don't. So PT data will account for that. It will do the calculations for the dead load stresses and for pre-stressing, you know, the equivalent load uh, moment diagram, shear, stresses, without that column there, if you tell it to. And that is typically our default. Um, when I give you the program for using in these courses, I change that default typically. So you're not questioning why we're not getting the same numbers. For this project that I did, I have this radio button clicked and not that. So I just left the columns be there, and that's why we did a moment distribution, distribution factors, and only had one set of distribution factors for all the load cases. But again, that's not a code requirement to do this correctly, but it's a realistic requirement. <laughs> um, again, I, I don't think anybody else's software actually accounts for this, but it is the correct, anatomically correct way to do this. Okay, that's... Um, that's part two of your project lectures. I am going to do one more lecture that just shows you how to use PT data in the next lecture. I, I guess we can call that an optional lecture if, if that's something you're interested in. Um, I would suggest you, you take a look at it and see what a day in the life of an actual post tensioner is and how quickly these things can get done and how we can design an entire parking structure in a matter of uh, at least the beams and the beams and the slabs in, the, in a matter of probably not even days, hours. Okay, thank you. See you at the next one.